Welcome to day three and welcome to this uh, session of inter intervention points and opportunities for collaboration. Uh, it's uh, an ambitious session because during this session we are going to try and attempt to, to summarize, uh, remind you of something about day one and also summarize day two, which was a super intense, super long, uh, and uh, we will provide you an, a, an attempt of a map and a few selection of points in day two. And then after that, uh, I'm going to introduce you the five panelists. Uh, and uh, this, this is going, uh, going to work in the following way. They're going to stand to sit, uh, they're sitting right now in first row. They're going to stand and react to the initial attempt to map uh, day one and day two and provide your contribution. It's a very diverse group of people coming from NGOs, uh, from academia, from uh, activists and from foundations and from companies. So look forward to hearing from them. Then after their short interventions, I will open up to you and the survivors of last night uh, that will <laughs> provide your own ideas uh, and comment and questions because um, uh, we are at a very interesting moment in these three days because uh, we already have put so much on the table. It's a wonderful opportunity to integrate, so provide your own point of view, to pose questions, of course, to the panelists, in general, to the audience. And then we will close the session, again, going back to the five panelists for a short uh, reaction. Maybe you'll pose the questions to, to them, or maybe uh, they want to add something to what we heard in this uh, approximately one hour of this session. So let's get started. Please, the slides. Okay. Okay, this slide was already shown to you uh, yesterday morning by um, Urs, and it was, uh, so it, I will just show it to you without going into detail. You've already seen it, but it just may be helpful to have a quick reminder of what we discussed in day one. So, something from the keynotes and something from the discussions uh, during the day. That, that informed what happened in the following day, which is yesterday. And um, after this reminder, let me prov try to provide you with an attempt to capture at least some of the amazing discussions of yesterday. So consider the following slides, uh, of course, as a selection. It's not exhaustive, otherwise it would have been like 120 slides at the least. So it's a selection and it tried to provide a map of the discussions yesterday. So the first part is uh, uh, to notice that uh, uh, different types of solutions and different types of problems, uh, uh, sometimes the, uh, we could cluster them by concept, uh, very abstract concepts like uh, transparency, access, bias, etc. And you heard that a lot during the day. In other cases, maybe less frequently, but in other cases, uh, technologists like me were talking about specific techni technical issues like specific kind of data or specific algorithms. And that's another way of uh, clustering the discussions yesterday. And finally, uh, we heard quite a bit, uh, and that's another way of clustering the solutions and the ideas, uh, uh, different moments, uh, different stages in the process. Uh, some discussions were focusing on contribution, focusing a lot uh, on the inputs, for instance, uh, of the process, uh, other on the outputs. Uh, and so that's another way of clustering. The second uh, map that I would like to share with you is that um, uh, we were handling and discussing very different time scales. In some cases, uh, people were saying, it's already late now, we have to act immediately because otherwise it's too late. In other cases, uh, we were saying, especially academics like me, were saying, wait a second, in order to provide thoughtful answers and thoughtful evidence, we need time. In some cases, years. And uh, both, we need both. And so, the, the many conversations can be analyzed looking at the time scales of the discussion. And um, one specific uh, issue that brings the, the topic of timescales is the uh, analogy with the global movement about the environment uh, that we heard uh, yesterday and also on the first day. And of course, that means uh, timescales which tend to be long because uh, it's a movement that is uh, still not comparable to the environmental movement. Uh, and also brings another dimension which is not timescale but is geographical global versus local, as you see in the last line of this uh, second block. Finally, in this uh, selection of, of potential maps and compasses, uh, we discussed a lot, uh, as is usually the case, uh, about uh, interdisciplinarity. It's generally an important topic that comes up often when we discuss of digital issues. 
but um, I would argue that you, we can make a case that in the case of AI, whichever, whichever way you want to define it, is even more important. Uh, because we bring up issues that are clearly outside the purely technical domain, like values, for instance. And therefore, uh, and that's, take it as my own personal uh, contribution, I'm a computer engineer, and, and so I was thinking aloud with other colleagues, uh, maybe in the curricula for computer science and computer engineer, we should make a much stronger case for uh, an education in, uh, of course, a partial education in humanities and social sciences for computer scientists, uh, uh, more specifically tied to the problems raised by AI and maybe mandatory rather than elective as is usually the case in many colleges and universities. And then besides interdisciplinarity, the need for dialogue uh, as usual among different stakeholders, which is uh, uh, something that we've uh, discussed so many times in these years in our domain. But let me also add uh, about different professions. Um, maybe we can make a case that um, we can remind ourselves that professions have a profound role in our society that has been weakening in the last decades, uh, and maybe we can uh, bring back their role, different kinds of professions, the professors, the diplomats, the lawyers, uh, the doctors, etc. And therefore we heard, for instance, uh, talking about diplomats, which is a profession, and uh, saying they were discussing AI without having you know, the proper base knowledge uh, to discuss the topic. So maybe we can also find, think about uh, involving professional organizations and uh, contribute to a more uh, uh, intense debate uh, among professions. Now, uh, open questions, drivers, and applications. This is a super arbitrary selection of the many things that happened yesterday. And so you will see that, for instance, uh, came up uh, the, the, maybe the need for a definition of AI, maybe a legal definition of AI. And let me tell you from the technical point of view, uh, as a computer scientist, uh, sometimes I, I had the, the fear that AI is stretched to, to cover almost anything. And that, of course, it's the uh, end of the definition, because otherwise, if it's everything, then it's nothing. So we have to be a bit more careful. Um, then, how do we find values in AI context? Uh, uh, when the very title of this conference, talking about inclusion, of course, brings up from the very beginning the idea of values. And uh, since this conversation was so uh, wonderfully representative uh, of many different points of view and also of many different geographical areas, uh, of course, values have different uh, meanings in different contexts. And uh, one thing that came up, and I personally witnessed it in uh, the conversation yesterday, is that maybe um, it's a chimera to think about debiasing uh, or being completely neutral. Uh, some people were saying it's, total, it's a total chimera. It's impossible to be unbiased. There is always bias. And so maybe we should strive, rather than debiasing, we should strive to uh, make explicit what are the values, what do we mean by the values, what are our biases, what are our objectives. Uh, third point, what is an ethical best business model for big tech? Um, what are appropriate remedy? And we heard several potential interesting solutions for that. And finally, uh, uh, the algorithms, uh, transparency of the algorithms, auditing of the algorithms, uh, so how do we audit algorithms, uh, like in the case of, of machine learning techniques that are not the traditional if-then-else kind of algorithms? And so there is active research also in computer science to shed some light uh, on the workings of this algorithm, therefore making it possible to audit them. And, um, and then the, the usual, old, the very old uh, question of uh, who are the proper auditors? So who is the custodian of the custodians? Um, and then, finally, do we want uh, a recipe? So, in, in other words, do we want a transparency on the algorithm and that's it? Uh, or do we want also uh, a more comprehensive understanding of the so-called health effect in this metaphor with, um, with the medicine? Um, or both? Probably, probably we def and my personal position is that definitely we want both. Okay, super selection of potential questions that came out yesterday. Um, then, like in day uh, two, like yesterday, we have uh, assembled a number, again, non-exhaustive, but I, we hope representative, uh, of uh, action items that came out yesterday from uh, 
um, creating, leading, facilitating interdisciplinary coalitions or platforms, uh, the creation of data commons that you heard yesterday, uh, open source requirements, um, how to sustain uh, and uh, the participation and the influence of the Global South in these discussions, uh, and the network of centers, potential role in all these, etc., etc. I will not go over all of them, but it's just to give you an idea of what we have collected with um, our note taking and our thinking. So uh, let me underline. Uh, and remind you, uh, four case studies uh, from the Global South and Undeserved Voices that uh, struck the attention of the audience. So it maybe it's, yeah, I think it's definitely worth it to uh, go through them again. We heard this Abafo Social in Brazil and its powerful message that algorithms shape reality. And that you can actually do something about it in some cases, like in the cases that they presented. Uh, the case of uh, the troubling case of background check information in Iran, so to be aware of how a certain technology apparently created for specific, uh, apparently innocuous uh, uh, objective can have uh, troublesome uh, uh, uses. A, weather forecasting a diagnosed prognosis in Uganda and the worries about um, human and data security in that case. And then uh, the fairly well studied and well known cases of uh, disparity of service uh, um, in the case of Uber, also Airbnb. Okay, and so this, let's remind about these cases and let's uh, keep our eyes open and also as a researcher, let's keep studying these uh, cases in order to um, make it more well known and understood worldwide. Now, let me conclude before I turn to our panelists with um, a few personal thoughts. If I may, um, something I've heard uh, and, or something that I thought or a combination of, of both. Um, uh, what is actually new and what is not new? It's a usual question, but uh, I think it's, it's particularly important for AI. There are, sometimes I was thinking when I was listening to the discussion, okay, this specific problem, it could have been posed 10 years ago exactly in the same way even though the technology at the time was not called AI. So maybe we can, I say that not to, for being skeptical, but because maybe we can learn. Maybe there is already methodologies and approaches and studies that can help us to understand uh, so problems that we think are completely new, but actually with a slight rephrasing or light, a slight reframing are actually old. And also avoiding the extremes, avoiding the typical, oh, everything is going to be completely changed and disrupted, we already heard that before, and also uh, everything is going to be catastrophic uh, and the uh, civilization is about to end. Let's avoid both, we know that are both untrue. Um, which is exactly the, the, the point about uh, avoiding everything will change both in the positive and the negative sense. Uh, third point, uh, uh, as an engineer, I was uh, reading reports, including the wonderful IDRC draft report that was uh, given to us a few days before coming to the, to the conference. Uh, I kept thinking, maybe uh, of, there are a lot of forecasts, but extremely hazy forecasts. And maybe uh, we can make a step forward trying to be, have a more precise definition of what is success in different domains. So let's discuss about specific AI application and then let's define together what is success. Is this 10% improvement, 20, 30% improvement? And secondly, the time scale. Is this success happening in six months or next year or in five years? It makes a huge difference. So maybe it could be worth it case domain by domain trying to be a bit, to agree on a definition of success and a time scale and then I use it as a reference and to go back in six months or one year and trying to assess what's going on with AI. Um, so that's what I mean by thresholds and timing. And finally, uh, I think you all agree with me that the conversation uh, this in this last couple of days and today uh, in Rio has been unique. Let me use this word unique because I attended many meetings that in some sense potentially similar to this one, but this to me is unique because the, the broad of point of views and experiences that I personally heard, uh, I never heard it 
this way. And this is uh, an amazing accomplishment of the organizers. Uh, and so therefore, it springs the question immediately is like, I want this to last. I don't want it to be an event, a point in time that leaves beautiful memories. Uh, it's already something, it's already important, but I wonder whether, and I pose it truly as an open question to you and to the panelists, uh, how can we sustain this? Is there a way where we can stay, sustain this inclusive, uh, extraordinary conversation? Okay. That's it. That's my, the summary, and I thank you all the crew for uh, providing me with all the wonderful notes uh, for uh, making this recap. And this presentation is also the basis uh, for the point of uh, departure for the interventions of the panelists and also from you, from the audience. The panelists will, if they want, react to this or add their own point of view or contribution. It's completely up to them. So let me uh, turn to them and... Uh, let me uh, invite uh, Alison Gilwald from the Research ICT Africa Network, um, based uh, in the South Africa. And uh, if you want to stand there and give you the microphone. Thank you. And you want to stay here? Okay. Should I? Oh, sure. it's okay. okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I am from Research ICT Africa, which is a public interest think tank on policy and, um, ICT policy and regulation. Um, with a membership across 20 countries in Africa. But I'm also based at the University of Cape Town in the Graduate School of Development Policy and Practice. So some of the points I'm making are um, really to the academy and as a critique of the academy, and some are around um, trying to build an informed evidence base for policy um, in this uh, area. So um, the first, I just, I mean, obviously there's too much to comment on, on all of them. So I thought what I would just speak about um, were two areas, mainly around the need for serious and genuine transdisciplinary um, research and proper engagement with that, not just a, a sort of a lip service to us needing to do it. And then also to look at the problems of data we have and how that impacts on biasing, participation, inclusion, et cetera, in relation to AI. But some of the broad, broad points I want to make really relate to um, the point you were making about what is new and what isn't new about AI. And um, really the complexity of the environment that we're in, the locating of um, artificial intelligence in the ICT ecosystem and not as something in a sort of linear and we've kind of gone through all these things and we're now um, at AI, but understanding it in the, in the ICT ecosystem because really that explains um, the multiple um, systems, the multiple levels of governance, global and national, et cetera, that you have to have in order for the... Um, uh, inclusion of people um, throughout, throughout the world. So um, part of that complexity really requires that we engage critically with other disciplines. So I think particularly in the area of ICT for D, in the area of technology, um, and often called society, there's not a critical engagement with um, a lot of the other things. If we're talking about using AI for development, we need to critically understand development. We need to critically engage with SDGs, not just use them because you know, they've been agreed by a whole lot of member states, etc. What are the problems? What are the challenges there? Um, critically you know, engage with the, with the language of multilateral agencies, because that is our job as the academy, is to engage with that critically and in, in a public interested way, in an independent way, to cut across some of the very vested interests that exist in the funding of research in this area um, and in the absence of funding of research in this area. And so even things like, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, it's just, it's used in a very uncritical sense. From a political economy sense, this is just a late phase um, capitalism, advanced capitalism. The contradictions that we're seeing around automation and unemployment are simply the contradictions of that kind of, um, you know, economic um, and political development. You know, there's nothing to suggest that there is a fundamental shift either in the technology or the power relations or anything else that, um, uh, sorry, I've lost my note here, that um, distinguish this from, uh, you know, from, a, from an earlier phase of, of, of development. Um, sorry, I'm just going to quickly see if I can find it again, otherwise I'll just talk without it. Um, seem to have lost it here. Um, okay, so um, the other point I just wanted to make um, quite quickly was, so you know, we need to interrogate these issues. If we look at things 
um, at the assumptions that are behind a lot of the um, paradigms for AI is actually the, um, you know, the assumptions are that we've got mature regulated markets that people are um, able to enjoy consumer choice in and that there's innovation. Whereas, in fact, if we look at the, um, you know, the um, impact on AI or the, the effect of AI or the potential impact of AI on um, less developed countries, we see a very different scenario. So the manifestations that are there, I'm not suggesting that the manifestations that are spoken about in the fourth industrial re revolution aren't there in mature economies, but they... Um, firstly, don't play out in the same way because of the uneven nature of capitalism and the uneven um, development across the continent, the ability to harness the benefits of globalization. In um, undeveloped economies, um, you simply don't get some of the same manifestations. So, for example, perhaps the um, concerns around automation in underdeveloped countries are not such a problem because we're unindustrialized. Um, and so we're not, you know, we're not going to lose those kinds of jobs. Um, just coming very quickly to the issues of data, I just wanted to speak about the complementary needs so in the complementary disciplinary area, the complementary multi-stakeholder area, but in the area of data, we need, complement, we need to use complementary data. Because um, uh, developing countries and African countries that I'm particularly concerned with are marginalised um, from uh, big databases, from the collection of public statistics, etc., we need to look at how we, could, we need to continue to do conventional um, demand-side research, which is the only way you can actually identify the points of policy intervention in prepaid mobile markets. You cannot get it from the supply-side data, and you, 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 know, you need to actually go and speak to people. Sensors, AI sensors, mobile phones don't actually tell you if that person is a man or a woman, if they're poor or if they're rich, etc. So we need to do this complementary data. And only by increasing the, not only the access, because I think it's really important that we move from just connectivity, to um, the usage, the intensity of use, the ability, the demand side, the capabilities aspects of being able to use that data that we're going to be able to even, you know, be represented in the, in the big data, in the big data analytics. So, I mean, that really raises the need to um, uh, nuance notions of marginalization. All marginal people aren't the same, so I raised the importance of, that was raised around intersectionality, the need to um, understand marginalization. There are people who are a little bit marginalized, there are people who are a lot more marginalized, there are people who are never going to come online, and how do we address those from a more demand side, public interest point of view than the current commercial, um, you know, appropriable returns kind of models that we've got that have provided enormous services in underdeveloped countries, but will still never be able to meet the... Um, be, uh, come, be uh, um, delivered at a cost that the, ma the majority of people can afford. So we need to nuance that. We need to use data in a complementary way. Um, and this is where I think artificial intelligence can be used to supplement um, weak institutions, weak governments, weak um, data gathering in order to plan better for you know, development by whatever you mean by that, um, economic growth, etc. But that will require levels of regulation that are very often not present in the kind of internet and open domain and, you know, thing. So it might require that we regulate algorithms, that we get transparency, that we get open data. Um, and I know this is very problematic um, because in many countries, our states are repressive, our states are not... Um, you know, functional democracies, etc. So the idea of the state getting more control, having access to your data, etc., are of course of, of, of major concern. But I think in these discussions there tends to be an absence of um, understanding or acceptance of the need for um, some public regulation, a, a role of the state, even if it's only an enabling role for the state, to allow the industry to take off and allow these incredible technological developments. So thank you, and uh, I invite uh, Chimayi Arun. You can speak from there if you want, as you, or you can come here, as you, up to you, from the Center for Communication Governance in Delhi. You've heard and seen her already before during this conference. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here um, because we were one of the very early members of the network of centers. I'm quickly going to tell you about the hats that I wear just because it's a particular hat that I'm speaking from today. Yeah, mixed metaphors, though this might be. Uh, so I'm an assistant professor of law at National Law University, Delhi, where I set up and have run the Center for Communication Governance since 2012. And I'm going to talk to you today uh, not as an assistant professor of law and a researcher that is interested in AI, but more as a person that 
that has built one institution within India in the Global South to deal with the new issue of the internet, internet governance and what it means. And as a director of a center that very early on got to be a part of this global network of centers and has seen the potential that it brings to the table. And so from that point of view, I thought that uh, what I'll do today is not discuss the substance. You've heard quite a lot of it all day. And I feel like the appropriate place sometimes to discuss the brass tacks can be the academic conferences, um, many of which I'm sure that we will share and that we will meet at. So I'm going to do this in three parts. One is I'm going to tell you what I was expecting when I came here. Um, and then I'll tell you what I heard. And finally, I will give you what you might call uh, my two cents. We call it my two paise in India. Um, and so um, I'm beginning basically with, see, I, I was lucky enough that this, this is a conference organized entirely by my very dear friends. It's the Global Network of Centers meets Berkman Klein Center meets ITS Rio. And so I knew that it would be a wonderful, energetic, interdisciplinary room full of people that really understood what they were working with, but that are also capable of constructive engagement with each other. So I, I was expecting all of that. The second thing which I'm sure that many of you noticed is that there is a special signaling to holding an event like this in the Global South, in Rio and in Brazil. We've been talking about how to make the Global South central to, to debates, and this is very much one way in which it can be done. Um, now, in terms of what I heard, the day, it's, it's been really interesting because most of the time I live in this law and regulatory theory silo. And this conference has brought together not only interdisciplinary academics, but also funders, people who are actually working with technology, people that are in the habit of building institutions, building out programs around the world. And I feel like the way in which they have been talking to each other is really interesting. Um, and I, I say this because, um, the takeaways that have emerged involve a lot of people that are sitting in this room. So the very first morning, the session that I moderated, Kathleen brought up something that to my mind was really valuable, which is that she, she said that if you want to integrate the Global South in debates about AI, the way to do it is to invest, right? And, and over time, um, I have seen people expand what we mean by invest. Yesterday, I heard someone make the distinction between the long-term solutions, the research, the building of expertise, and the more immediate solutions, Juan Carlos also highlighted this today, the need to react immediately, but also the capacity to be able to do so. I, I think that that's, uh, that's something that we really want to keep in mind as we figure out what to do here. Um, and then um, mo moving on from there, my, uh, my two paise is basically, uh, so what do we do? And the reason that I'm talking about this from an um, from a more director of a center hat point of view is that I feel like a lot of the pieces to the puzzle, they are in this room. We all, um, we've worked on this before in the context of internet governance. Um, to give you examples, when, when my center started, there wasn't a lot of teaching on internet governance. I find that after six years, when I'm looking back at what happens when you fund a center in the Global South, build out not just academic programs, but also programs that are able to engage with policy, you build a pool of people that I am now meeting at conferences, I'm meeting my students working in various institutions, speaking both the language of the global north, which is necessary for engagement at the global level, but also from a point of view that understands our local context. And so when I say invest, I mean um, not just in parachuting in expertise, but in helping the global south build something out that is consistent with its own point of view. And I say this not just in the spirit of diversity is good, I know we should include the global south, but from the point of view that in global debates and in the framing of norms, the Global South has always brought in ideas that have been central, um, central to the building out of human rights. So for example, introducing gender in the human rights treaties, that was actually an Indian foreign policy representative that, that proposed it. Um, if you see the negotiations uh, for the TRIPS and the WTO, similarly, you'll see that the Global South had, has made very valuable contributions. Um, yeah, so I, I would say that definitely invest. And, and the last one is that I feel like this presents a great opportunity, both in terms of very constructive things that can be done with AI, making helping the Global South learn much more than just about AI, but also in putting our heads together and building out the solution. We're never going to have one sort of ready, uh, ready to go today, but we, we can put it together, I think, over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jimei.
Now we have Maria Paz um, Canales of the Ratios Digitales in Chile, Executive Director. So, Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I have the privilege to be the first one that will probably summarize uh, this uh, wonderful symposium from a different point of view, from the point of view of the more activist organization. I, my organization is Derechos Digitales, as Juan Carlos mentioned. Uh, Chilean-based organization, but we work in Latin America in all issues related with uh, human rights and technology. So from that point of view, uh, the first one, the first thing that I want to uh, stress, it's uh, my agreement to this call for the multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary work, and particularly to bridge uh, the separation that many times happen, unfortunately, between the academic work and the activism work. We have uh, our own capacities of research, but many times we are short in the resources and the uh, capabilities uh, in-house to conduct really deep research that allows us to uh, have enough data to be really effective in the advocacy policy work that we want to conduct. So I really celebrate this kind of conference in which we have opportunity to have more conversation, to enlarge the network of connection with the academic world in a way that we can uh, try to uh, envision how we can continue working together for the future to solve this really problematic question about how technology is evolving. The second point that I want to make, it's like a reaction of what Juan Carlos was presenting in his uh, own uh, summarize of the main ideas of, of these uh, days. It's related to what, what is success? From the activism point of view that I mentioned at the beginning, for me, success in the field of AI is related with uh, arrive to an agreement, a general agreement, a general consensus about the urgent need of a full human rights assessment uh, in the decision making of uh, moving forward in developing this kind of technology, in the decision making in the design of this technology, and in the decision making of the implementation of this technology. And uh, when I am pointing out to this, I want to go further to just the privacy issues that usually are on stage when uh, we talk about uh, artificial intelligence. This is not just a matter about uh, to try to reset the, uh, the, the current rules about privacy or data protection frameworks or how to access to more data about how we are being uh, uh, in some way uh, put in a box for this new technology that is the artificial intelligence, but it's more about how we try to find the values to design, to, to implement this technology that preserve the dignity of human beings. So it could be completely uh, artificial and completely machine uh, driven, the technology, but at the end, the only purpose that it has is to serve human beings, to serve us. So we need to reposition that in the analysis and not only the economical advantage that can have the implementation of artificial intelligence, but uh, in the perspective of making really useful for achieving a, a better uh, and, and fulfillment of the human rights. In, in the same line, I want to say that what is new? That was another question uh, that Juan Carlos was uh, presenting to us. What is new? I think that fundamentally new in the artificial intelligence issue, it's the, the problem of the scale. And the problem that it's everywhere, potentially it's a tool that uh, can uh, in some way uh, affect everyone everywhere and without really knowing that what is going on. So, uh, but, there is also a data implication that uh, go further to the traditional concept of uh, uh, data management that we have. It's not only related to the things that uh, are directly um, uh, useful to identify person, but a lot of uh, implication on deriving conclusions about behaviors, about population, about put uh, tag uh, to certain groups that uh, are being made, uh, being made in, in a way that is totally different from which we uh, have been done uh, in, in the history of humanity. Uh, 
So I want to conclude just uh, to how I see the possible solution of, of, of for, for this that, of course, I'm not going to find here. Probably we will not do it in just a symposium, even it's a very valuable uh, opportunity to uh, do this brainstorming. And I think that the key issue is to try to find new methodologies to, to, to uh, build this uh, need of fairness. As Juan Carlos was pointing out, there is no possibility of the bias uh, artificial intelligence, but we can build a, a way uh, to make it more fair and more reasonable, and we need a methodology that uh, stress the way in which uh, people can have an opportunity to participate in creating these values. This will be the really uh, inclusive artificial intelligence, and for that, I think we need to learn a lot of the movements that uh, uh, were going on before in consumer field, in, in environmental field, as has been mentioned before, even in labor uh, field. And from there, we can have valuable lessons on how to plug certain instances of more democratic decisions about the values that are inserted in the artificial intelligence. But for that, we also need to burst the bubble, not just being the same people that we are here, but communicate this message at large to our fellow citizens in our countries, especially in the global south, so they can understand there is an urgent need to pay attention to this now and not leave it for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria Paz. Now, different point of view. Vera France. Deputy Director of Open Society Foundations. I'll give you my mic in a second, just presenting you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm, um, as Carla said, Vera, and I'm working with the uh, Open Society uh, Information Program. So I want to pick up on Maria's point on bursting bubbles, because I think that is a very, very good approach. And I want to speak about five uh, fields or movements I think we need to connect with to make progress on this issue. Uh, some of them obvious, but um, the first one, social justice community. Uh, I think it was really, all, all of us were touched by this abafo social yesterday, and Carlos brought it up as well, because um, it really sort of connects and shows where the injustice lies in a very uh, compelling way, and I think we need many more stories of this type. Um, it's not always as easy to uh, explain the bias um, as it is in this case because it's very directly visible. Um, so in some other instances, probably many of you are familiar with uh, the work that Julia Ongwin at ProPublica did. She basically demonstrated there is racial bias in the uh, uh, risk scores for recidivism. Basically in the United States, um, uh, uh, judges use a tool to determine the likelihood of reoffending. And this is used in, to determine bail, um, uh, early release, uh, and sentencing. And she showed there is a racial bias um, and exposed that, I think, more much. And, and that took a year, so it is a lot of work to showcase this bias, but I think much more of this type of work needs to be done. Um, and only then, I think, can we also change the discourse. So I was quite impressed to hear that, I think, in India, you know, most stories are positive about AI, not only was it four or something that are critical. So I think we need to invest much more into these investigations, and they need to be, of course, interdisciplinary. So bringing together investigative journalists, data scientists, researchers like yourself, and then also extract from these examples what are the policy recommendations. And that's where I think a lot of you come in. You know, again, in the Desabafo Dis Social, it's pretty straightforward. It's search, uh, search results need to reflect the population, right? That is the ask. Um, and then on some other more complex uh, cases, of course, the demands are, much, are a bit more complex, but again, we have smart policy people in this room, and that's where I think some of the efforts need to be focused. The second um, field or movement, uh, which I know some of you are part of as well, is the intellectual property or rather access to knowledge movement. So uh, we talked, I think Mark Sorman yesterday talked about the data commons and how we need to uh, sort of potentially think along those lines um, to create sort of data sets that can be used um, 
by everybody and not uh, just private companies, but also this idea of patent pools uh, and how can we sort of take this idea and use it in this space. So a patent pool basically is a consortium of players agreeing to cross-license patents, and in this case, it be, could be to cross-license data, right? And of course, the question is, what's the incentive for a big player like Google to do this and join such a pool? I think it's probably more attractive to smaller companies. But again, it's an idea that uh, all of you who have worked on IP and A2K are very familiar with, and sort of how, what's the applicability of this idea in this field? Uh, third, uh, is open government data movement. Uh, so I think we also heard in this conference that, uh, for example, the digital corpus of the European Parliament, and I think the Canadian Parliament, is being used for very interesting um, project to create voice recognition, etc. Uh, so again, there's a whole movement out there, the open government data movement. It's probably now 10, 15 years old or so. And so it's you know, probably worth having a conversation with them about what are some of the use cases. So what data have they liberated in the past 10, 15 years? And what are some of the use cases for these data sets? Um, two more and then I'm done and I'll be very quick with the last two. Um, you know, a lot of this is about, um, I agree with Alison, late capitalism playing out. So, um, really like confronting the power of the powerful and how do we do this? And I think one other interesting tool is antitrust. Uh, in, uh, we've recently convened, uh, one of our partners has convened a meeting of competition authorities in Latin America to explore how to use the law, the competition laws here vis-a-vis -vis these platforms. There's quite some action, as you know, in Europe and in the US there is a seed of hope around antitrust, I think, especially if the Democrats will get to power in the future again. Lastly, um, this has come up in a session on infra data infrastructures as well. This is, as I, Elsin called it, late capitalism, structural inequalities, and uh, I was surprised that <laughs> Not once did I hear during this whole week uh, the Paradise Papers. So, you know, a lot of the uh, powerful AI producers and sort of platforms are obviously part, sort of using tax havens. So, and again, there's a whole field out there fighting for tax justice. And as we're some of these <laughs> players using, avoiding taxes, I think it worth also connecting with that movement around tax justice in how, again, to confront the power of these huge internet platforms and the future owners of AI. Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you so much, Vera. And uh, Victor Akinvande, uh, from IBM Research Africa, based in Nairobi, if I'm not wrong. Please. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, it's been an exciting event. Uh, my name is Victor Kiwande. I work in the healthcare team at IBM Research Africa in Nairobi. And I'll, I'll just talk a bit about some of the things that uh, I've learned in course of this event and some of the key, uh, some of the key takeaways and some of the ideas that have really struck me. Uh, for me, the biggest pain points when it comes to uh, matters of AI and uh, inclusion is capacity and education. Because uh, coming from a, develop, uh, from a developing country, uh, I feel like, I strongly believe that we need to deviate from a consumerism um, approach and move to um, a point where uh, we're, we're less at the risk of uh, Western imperialist uh, values trumping our own cultures. And this is, this is very important because it puts us at a fragile position when uh, we need to negotiate things that uh, have, to, have to do with uh, issues of data governance and, and data ownership. And it also makes us have to fight to encode our own, um, to encode our own ethical uh, values. And as uh, my colleague mentioned, we need to, the global north and everyone really needs to uh, invest and ensure that this capacity is actually um, developed. Another thing that really struck me over the course of uh, the event is um, the need for us to, debu to debunk uh, the binary narratives. Uh, and this is important as well in the global south because uh, I can speak for Nigeria, 
uh, policymakers, they, they don't really, uh, their views are shaped largely by the narratives that they read and the narratives that they, um, they hear. So it's important for experts to put out their objective, in my opinion, objective, uh, but skeptical optimism, optimistic um, narratives about beneficial artificial intelligence. And this also needs to be done more and more by people from the global south. Thirdly, uh, I also, I also, I would also like to see uh, more and more discussions around the impact and influence of AI on society, uh, on in the long term and also in short term, and we also need to see how we can encourage more people to uh, be critical about uh, their use. Uh, of artificial intelligence. I was speaking with a colleague from Costa Rica and mentioned that young people, like they're just, they just, they will readily, uh, they readily accept these technologies and they don't really think critically about what the impact of these technologies is. We need to encourage more people to think critically um, about applications of AI in their society. Another thing I would like to mention is uh, the need for, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the, Discussions here have, have focused, have spoken about uh, how important inter an interdisciplinary approach is, and I, it's we can't overemphasize that. Basically, we need to expose engineers. Uh, I come from a technical background. We need to exp expose engineers to ethics as part of their training. I think it's very, very important. Uh, we, it's 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 also helpful, as was mentioned yesterday, to have a shared understanding of uh, the various interdisciplinary interdisciplinary issues. Uh, soci sociologists, politicians, um, technologists, we all need to have this uh, common ground, uh, basically. So true inter interdisciplinary is key, as you mentioned. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention is garbage in, garbage out, as, as we're fam familiar with it in computer science. The least we can do is to demand that developers of um, artificial intelligence systems prove that the input to their systems are representative and very inclusive. Uh, in my opinion, I think the way forward for collaboration uh, in line with this session is the way forward uh, for AI should be guided by collaboration. And again, we need a multi-stakeholder um, approach to have meaningful debates about this um, issue. And my final thought uh, is about the Global South and the need for us to stop uh, taking a back seat, uh, in my opinion, and widen aggressively our participation in AI. And I'll, I'll end with a quote by Abraham Lincoln, where he said, um, achievement has no color. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for these thoughtful, uh, interesting contributions. Now, we have approximately 10 minutes for uh, the audience, which I'm glad to see has increased in size, uh, slowly coming to back. Uh, good, uh, welcome. and. Um, about 10 minutes, uh, and I uh, recommend that you try to address either questions to the, the audience or short comments uh, that can help uh, to have a richer conversation, please. It's freezing in here, and <laughs> anything you could do about it would be greatly appreciated. Um, something that I find a bit disturbing about this discussion is uh, uh, something that's missing, which is the discussion of autonomy. Usually when we interact with technologies, we have some modicum of control over how we interact with them. I feel like with AI, I'm a participant in the Hawthorne experiments. Remember that? Everyone know what I'm talking about? Where workers were observed, um, how they, productive they were, and um, you know when they worked under light, they were more productive. And I think I feel that way about my own interaction with AI because I don't know when I'm interacting with AI. I mean, obviously now I know I'm interacting with when I use Siri, I don't, or when I, you know, use Google Search, um, or when I use, you know, if I did use Lyft or Uber. But um, I think in general we don't know when we're interacting, and so that's why I think the question of autonomy is so important. I also feel a little bit that this discussion about in inclusion ignores, to some extent, the human right. I, I wish we would think about this, to some extent, uh, more from a human rights perspective. And what I mean by that is just, is this empowering us to meet our potential, or is it, at times, 
undermining our ability to meet our potential. Sorry for that elaboration. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, over there? It's on. It's on. Thank you very much. I think I want to thank Chin Mai uh, for reminding all of us that in the end, this is all about leadership. It's all about uh, the diversity within each one of us, that when we wear different hats, we also know we attend events under different contexts and capacities. And in that case, thank the organizers, in particular Carlos, uh, Leonardo, and of course, Uaz and the Bachman teams for bringing the diversity people we are into this room. Some of us who come from the right sector, if we are left with some of the corporations, the kind of productive discussions and engagements that have taken place in the last three days wouldn't take place. I think we start off as antagonists. And so when we meet under this environment with this leadership, it's really good because we take away lots of constructive and positive. So Chinmay, thank you for reminding us about that. And at the end, of, and uh, after all, I want also to appreciate the fact that the network is growing. We are talking of inclusion. When we met for the first time at the uh, Bachman Center, I was the only person who came from, uh, who was black, and I was worried. Now, when I get so many Kenyans in this room today, Kenyans alone, and then Africans, inclusion has been achieved to a very large extent. And also the global south is happening in place in Rio. So I think going forward, it can only get better. So thank you, Chinmay, for reminding us that we take more aggressive leadership role in growing the network to make it better for the rest of society. Thank you. Thank you. I think there is a hand here, I think. OK. Please remember to introduce yourself at the beginning. Hi, I'm uh, Shaz Jameson from Tilts in the Netherlands. Um, I wanted to raise the question about education and capacity building. We've come back to this point a lot about how to help uh, solutions emerge from the South and be more inclusive globally, that we need education and capacity building on a technical level. Great, that's non, uh, you know, not a discussion. But uh, Victor, you said that for engineers, we need to teach social science and teach ethics. And my question is that some of my colleagues at TILT are doing this. They are in engineering master's degrees trying to teach ethics. And it is incredibly hard to say, why is this relevant? And to carry across that message about basically, if your intention is to build something that will go to Silicon Valley and you know make a million or whatever, why should we care? And I think I'd like to, if anybody has any suggestions, I'm very happy to hear it. Um, particularly about methodology, is rather than talking in the abstract of what we need, but how to make this concrete and actually carry it forward, I think that's something we need to still uh, address, particularly as a network. Thank you. Um, I think you. that this, obviously, uh, for me, is perhaps one of the most inclusive conferences I've been to. And since I'm mostly traveling in Asia, then for me that was a really great opportunity to engage with the Global South. I think that this has been achieved and it's pretty remarkable, but we still have a really long way to go because oftentimes we talk about values that everyone in this room agrees with, but the minute you bring them out into other countries, they're not going to agree with us. And we need to bring these disagreements into this room and talk about this because, for example, I had uh, breakfast this morning with Nagla and we were talking about democratizing AI. And we said, oh, democratizing AI is so great. And I said, yeah, but I have no idea how to translate it into Chinese. So the sense that you know, we all agree that there are common values that are not shared by a lot of people who are very prominent in, in the development of AI. And I think that another thing that for me was missing is kind of the strategic map of understanding which countries are going to be very influential and what are the points in which we need to engage with these people and how. I think that there was a lot of um, emphasis on building cohesion here, which is fantastic but we are missing out on a pretty significant part of the world. I mean, Asia is home to over half of the world's population. And we do have India, which is fantastic, but it does not represent a lot of the countries in East Asia that do have that progress. And I think that this is perhaps a, a goal that the network could aspire to. This is obviously my first time interacting with you, so I don't have a lot of uh, information about what happened so far, but I'm thoroughly impressed. And I feel like if you achieved this, I can only imagine what you can achieve um, if you go on and, and set that as a goal. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, a comment to Shaz's question on how uh, 
uh, how to um, insert social science uh, values in, uh, in the education of, uh, of, uh, technolo of future technology makers. And I'm, I'm borrowing from uh, the proposals of both PASS on uh, inserting values into technologies and VERA to, to connect with uh, more communities um, from the perspective of previous examples on uh, internet governance and uh, GRM standardization, we've been able to explain what was fair use or what were the different values to be respected when we went to public forums of uh, international standardization and it seems that there's, there's not such, a, there are no, no such bodies for, uh, for the development of, uh, of AI, or maybe Juan Carlos or other uh, uh, computer scientists, you would be aware of which IEEE conference is the key global international arena on where to connect not only with uh, the students, but with uh, the professors who are currently developing uh, technologies. Thank you. One more question. Um, so I'll just go ooh, really, really quickly and um, uh, just, sorry, this is really loud. <laughs> um, uh, echo what Alex said, I just am so honored truly to be here uh, and to have been part of these few days. Um, one issue that I think did not come up um, is actually the, the environmental and physical resource toll of AI. Uh, and then it's sort of, I think you spoke about this yesterday in your talk, but I'm not sure. Um, uh, right, like the cloud is, is not actually a cloud. It takes energy and um, minerals from the ground and um, and that of course is feeding into climate change which we know affects um, more vulnerable populations than others. So I just think in the future it would be great to sort of tie those concerns into some of some of our conversations. Thank you so much. If you allow me in the interest of time, unless there is a burning question for one of the panelists to go back to them. But before going back to them, asking them a tweet, the long tweet, so you can use 280 characters if you want. But let me uh, react because it's really my field to the comment about engineers and education of engineers. And um, because I'm an engineer, a computer engineer, and I'm involved also in the rethinking of the curricula in my own university. And I think that the, it's complex because we have to remind, first of all, the universities are not only for training professionals, but also to educating citizens, and that has been largely absent in many European universities, is stronger in the US. And the second point is that um, uh, if we remind engineers that they're also professionals, as I was mentioned at the beginning, the idea that they are professionals, what is a professional, uh, what are the duties of a professional, that's maybe the easiest entry point then to talk about ethics and their role in society, I think. Okay, let's go back to our panelists for uh, final a uh, very quick round. Alison, please. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say that I, it, it's sort of as if we expect certain things to be happening online when they're not even happening offline. So, you know, whether it's human rights or whether it's, you know, connectivity or access, we sort of, you know, expect there to be open data, there's open government, whatever it is, um, when it's, you know, there's repression or, you know, not, an, not a failure to exercise rights. So I just wanted to sort of flag that because I think we keep coming back to the same problems because these are fundamental developmental challenges that we're facing. And I just wanted to say in terms of learning from other areas, which I think is absolutely critical and I think everybody's emphasized that, is that some of these um, intersections require different kinds of responses. So if we take the commons, for example, the commons have really developed um, in terms of the data commons, in terms of um, creative commons licensing, et cetera, 
um, even copy left, in some ways in opposition to um, formal systems. So they've become formal systems, but they've actually developed in opposition to those. Whereas other kinds of commons, which I would also suggest is a way of addressing inequalities and, and social exclusion and so social justice issues, um, in the area, for example, of infrastructure commons, really require um, state participation. And so you've really got to sell the idea of, the, you, you know, you can't get open spectrum. And open spectrum would allow a whole lot of people who can't get services through commercial things to access unlicensed spectrum, possibly to innovate, possibly to create AI, et cetera. But it's going to require, you know, even though we can learn in terms of um, concepts of openness, concepts of commons, et cetera, in application to certain of the challenges we face, we might have to approach it you know, differently. And very quickly, I mean, the open date, the open government thing, which Kenya was, you know, a big leader on, all the legislation's there, but there's literally no open data in practice. So it's actually the implementation that's the real challenge in the developing context. Sorry, longer than whatever character. Um, yeah, I, so, so what I've heard is a, is a really rich and broad ecosystem of problems, and I think that the immediate thing that I would like to see is the beginnings of an ecosystem map. So we have foreign policy issues, we have very local issues, we have global north versus global south, we have intersectionality, intersectionality marginalization, academics, activists, and I feel like really the best that, most of, that any of us can do is find our corner, figure out how to be effective, figure out how we can, what is the strategic way in which we can join hands to be more effective in particular contexts and then go at it. But the trouble with AI is that it's moving so fast that that information is not very organized right now. So I, I think that one of the outcomes that I would like to see from this space and this conference is an ecosystem mapping so that we can understand how individually and together we can manage to be as effective as possible. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with the, the points that have been already made. I think that um, just adding a little bit uh, to the last uh, thing that Timaya was mentioning, I think that after we have that map, we need to be like really strategic in how we use that map in the sense that uh, not everyone can do everything. Uh, each area or each field of work, it's, it's different and have like their own advantages. So we need to work collaboratively to define the strategies and to um, allocate uh, the task for each one in who we are better. And second and lastly, I want to just come back to the idea of this uh, democratic of the selection of the principles that we want to uh, feed uh, the, interf the int uh, artificial intelligence. But for doing that, we need uh, to open first the black box because as I heard uh, yesterday in one session, we cannot uh, find what is missing if we don't know what is inside. So we need uh, the help of regulation, the help of uh, the collaboration and conversation with the uh, public and private sector to open the box. Um, yeah, so for me, uh, I'm wondering if even if we get everything right, so let's assume we, uh, you know, bake social justice into these systems and human rights and a lot of the values we care about, um, you know, there will always be things we can't measure. Where is the friction that would allow us not to follow rules, uh, which for me is a lot of a you know, what makes us human. And I just want to remember, some of you have seen it, Mimi yesterday uh, the, presented a couple of artistic, pro artistic projects that raised uh, awareness about these issues. Uh, a self-driving car in a circle, so it was in a parking lot, in a circle, a continuous circle was driven around it. And the self-driving car is programmed to say if there is a continuous line, you don't move, you don't cross the line, right? And so the car was stuck, right? As opposed to a human would say, you know what? There's nothing around me, I can drive. So I'm just wondering, you know, even if we get the perfect sort of rules, where's the friction not to follow rules? Thank you. So I'm just going to... Uh add to what everyone has already said by saying that uh, in discussing how um, we, we also should discuss how AI would be regulated, not just globally, but uh, locally uh, within an accepted uh, framework, 
right? That that is also inclusive. Uh, I think we should individually uh, continue these conversations in our respective uh, communities and strive to uh, collaborate uh, for that in building a more inclusive AI society because the benefits are are, are clear and we just keep to, uh, we just need to keep having these discussions and conversations. So thank you to our uh, great panelists, all five of them. Thank you, and thank you all for participating and listening to this, to this session. The mic back to Becca. Thank you. <laughs>